Chapter 6 of The Blind Musician. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Blind Musician by Vladimir Krolenko. Chapter 6 The Crisis An Attempt at Synthesis. On the following day, the blind man awoke early. All was quiet in his room, neither was there as yet any movement in the house. Through the window, which had remained open into the garden during the night, came the freshness of the early morning. His memory had not yet recalled to him the events of the previous day, but his whole being was filled with a new and unusual sensation. Peter lay for several moments in bed, listening to the twitter of a bird in the garden, and to the feelings stirring within his own heart. "'What has happened to me?' he thought, and at this very moment— the words which were spoken to him in the twilight near the old mill flashed into his mind is it possible that you had never thought of this how dull you are it was true peter had never thought of it evelyn's presence had always been a joy to him but until yesterday he had never realized the fact any more than one realizes the air he breathes those simple words had fallen into his soul like a pebble upon the glassy surface of a stream one moment it was placid, serenely reflecting the sunlight and the blue sky. A toss of a pebble, and it is shaken to its very depths. Now he awoke like one newly born, and Evelyn, his old companion, appeared to him in an altered light. As he recalled one by one the incidents of yesterday, even the most minute, he heard with fresh surprise the accents of her altered voice as reproduced by his imagination how stupid you are don't my darling instantly peter rose dressed himself and ran through the dewy garden to the old mill the water was murmuring and the wild cherry bushes whispering the same as ever only then it had been dark and now it was a bright sunny morning never before had light produced so palpable an effect upon him the bright rays of the cheerful sun seemed to mingle with the dewy fragrance of the universal freshness of the early morning, stirring his nerves to a gentle excitement. But together with this pleasing agitation there arose in the inmost depths of the blind man's heart another and a different feeling, so vague and shapeless that at first he did not realize its presence, but gradually it grew to be a part of himself, like the strain of melancholy that sometimes weaves itself imperceptibly through a merry song. It rose from the depths of his soul as from small beginnings a heavy cloud gathers in the heated atmosphere, and just as a cloud is expanded by rain, so was this emotion deepened by rising tears, until it grew to predominate over every other feeling. It was but recently that her words had sounded in his ears, and he could remember every detail of that first explanation. He seemed still to feel her silken hair and to hear the throbbing of her heart against his own, and out of all this he wrought an image that made his own heart beat with joy. Yet now a dark and shapeless something rises to blight this image with its poisonous breath and to cause it to vanish into empty air. In vain did Peter go afterwards to the mill and spend hours at a time there, beset by contending feelings, endeavouring to recall to his imagination Evelyn's words, her voice, and her movements. He had lost the power that once he possessed of uniting them in one harmonious whole. From the very beginning there had been an intangible something that he had been unable to grasp, and now this something was rising above his head, as a storm cloud rises from the horizon. The sound of her voice was hushed, all the impressions of that happy evening had grown dim, and behold, a void was in their place, to fill which void there rose from the depths of the blind man's soul a yearning desire. He longed to see her, the sudden shock that had roused that evenly balanced youthful nature from its brief slumber had likewise awakened the fatal element that contained within itself the germs of irrepressible suffering. He loved her and longed to see her. Part 2 Their guests had once more left them, and life returned to its usual regularity at the Popelsky Manor. 
but the temper of the blind man had undergone a decided change. It had become variable and easily agitated. When at times his happy moments rose vividly before him, he grew more cheerful and his face brightened. But this did not last long, and in the course of time even these cheerful moments were dimmed by the fear that they were about to vanish, never to return. Thus his temper grew very uneven, outbursts of demonstrative affection and of extreme nervous excitement were often succeeded by days of secret gloom and melancholy, and at last the mother's worst fears were realized. The fevered dreams of childhood returned to the youth. One morning Anna Mikhailovna went into her son's room. He was still sleeping, but with a strange and restless sort of slumber. His eyes were partly open, and seemed to peer from beneath his eyelids. His face was pale and wore an expression of alarm. The mother paused as she cast a scrutinizing glance at her son, trying to discover the cause of this mysterious terror, which seemed momently to increase. But as she watched, the strained expression on the sleeper's face grew more intense. Suddenly she became aware of an almost imperceptible movement above the bed. A sunbeam was shining on the wall over the head of the sleeper, and as it glided downward, its vibrations grew more and more rapid. This brilliant ray of light was stealing its way to the half-open eyes, and the nearer it came, the greater grew the restlessness of the sleeper. Anna Mikhailovna remained motionless, as if gazing at a nightmare. She could not turn her eyes from the golden beam, which was drawing slowly but perceptibly nearer and nearer to her son's pale face which had become almost rigid under the prolonged strain. The yellow light had now begun to play over the hair and forehead of the youth. Instinctively the mother leaned forward to shield him, but her feet refused to move, as if she too were under some mesmeric influence. Meanwhile the sleeper raised his eyelids and the sunbeam sparkled on his motionless eyeballs. His head outlined against the pillow was turned toward the light. Something between the smile and the sob quivered on his lips, and again his face lapsed into its former rigidity. At last, by a supreme effort of will, the mother overcame the torpor that had crept over her, and going up to the bed, placed her hand on her son's head. He started and awoke. Is that you, mamma? he asked. Yes, it is I. He rose on his elbow. It was as if his consciousness were still obscured by a sort of haze. The next moment he said, I was dreaming again. I often dream now, but I can remember nothing. Part 3 More than a year passed thus, periods of gloom alternating in the young man's nature with a nervous irritability, and at the same time his senses, especially that of hearing, grew more and more acute. That his entire organism was susceptible to the light was evident even by night. He always knew when the moon was shining, and would often remain out of doors, sitting motionless and sad, when all the others in the house were sleeping, giving himself up to the influence of that dreamy and fantastic light, his pale face meanwhile turned ever in the direction of the luminous globe that was traversing the dark blue sky, and his eyes reflecting the luster of its cold rays. But when the globe, growing larger and larger as it drew near the earth, became veiled by a heavy red mist, and finally disappeared below the horizon line, the face of the blind man would soften and grow calm, and he would rise and go to his room. As to his thoughts during these long nights, it would not be easy to describe them. Every one who has experienced the joys and sorrows of self-consciousness is familiar with a crisis that occurs at a certain period of life, when a man, still pausing on the threshold, strives to define to himself the place he occupies in nature, his object in life, and his relations to the surrounding world. This is, so to speak, a dead point. Unfortunate is the man whom the impetus of life's power carries through it unharmed. In Peter's case, this crisis was seriously complicated. To the question, what is the object of one's life, he added another, what is the object of a blind man's life? Finally, into this travail of sad thoughts, 
entered another element, an almost physical pressure of unsatisfied desire, which reacted on his disposition. He grew more and more nervous and irritable, without an apparent cause. I long to see, he said, when this mood had so far relaxed that he could speak of it with Evelyn. I long to see, and I cannot overcome this desire. Could I but once, even in a dream, see heaven and earth, and the bright sunlight, and remember it all, could I but thus see my father and mother, you and Uncle Maxim, I should be satisfied and never be distressed again. And he persistently clung to that idea. When alone, he would take up different objects, feel of them with unusual attention, and then, putting them aside, try to recall their familiar outlines. In the same way, he studied the difference between bright-colored surfaces, which the abnormally keen perceptions of his nervous system enabled him to distinguish quite readily by the touch. But all this simply conveyed to Peter's mind information in regard to his own relations to things, without giving him a clearly defined idea of their intrinsic properties. He could distinguish the difference between day and night from the fact that the sunbeams, in some mysterious way, penetrated his brain, irritating still more keenly his agonizing queries. Part 4 Peter had lost all interest in the books that Maxim used to read aloud to him, and nothing ever arrested his attention now unless it bore directly or indirectly upon his own affairs. Once he interrupted the reading to ask, Red ringing, carmine ringing, what does that mean? Can one see color in tones? No, replied Maxim, but some sounds make an impression analogous to that of color. I am not sure that I shall be doing right, or even if I shall succeed in explaining this analogy to you, so that you will be able to understand it, but I have often thought of it myself, and this is the way it appears to me. Whenever I look upon a bright red surface of any considerable dimensions, it produces on me the impression of something flexible and quivering. It seems as if this red surface were changing every instant, rising from the substratum of a deeper color, it throbs, so to speak, with swift pulsations of a lighter shade, making a most vivid impression on the eyes. That may be the reason why a certain kind of ringing is called red. Yes, yes, wait a moment, said Peter, quickly opening the piano, and with practice hand he struck the keyboard in imitation of the holiday bell ringing. The illusion was unusually perfect. A chord in the middle register served as a background, while the clearer high notes rose over it as though leaping and bounding through the air. Is that it? asked the blind man. Yes, that is like it, and I know persons who are as unpleasantly affected by those sounds as I myself am affected by the color. I believe the expression carmine ringing refers to post bells. After a bell has been ringing for a long time, it grows monotonous. The sound becomes deeper, softer, and more uniform, although it is still as distinct as ever. The same effect may be obtained by a skillful selection of the different tones. Now listen, said Peter, and under his fingers the piano rang out like the spasmodic peals of a post-bell. Mm, no, that is not the way, said Maxim. You must play more softly. Ah, yes, I remember. And now the instrument sent forth tones, low, rhythmical, and sad, like the music of a set of bells under the duga of a Russian troika, receding along the dusty road in the dim vista of evening, a sound low and monotonous, growing softer and softer, until the last notes are lost amid the silence of the quiet fields. Ah, now you have it. You have caught the idea, said Maxim. Our language possesses certain definitions applicable to our conceptions of sound and light, as well as of touch. Thus, we use the word brilliant in regard to tones, and also in regard to colors, and the word soft, belonging primarily to the sense of touch, may also be applied to colors. We even say a warm color, a cold color, of course, this is only by way of analogy, but they show some points of resemblance. Some time ago, while you were still a child, your mother tried to explain colors to you by means of sounds. Yes, I remember. Why did you forbid us to continue? 
perhaps I might have succeeded in understanding. No, replied Maxin, that would have been impossible, and all your labor would have been in vain. You can study an object by itself, as far as its form and the space it occupies are concerned, and you seem able, in some inscrutable way, to perceive vague differences in color, but in order to gain any distinct ideas of form, size, and color, the sense of sight is absolutely indispensable. The sooner you give up your vain efforts, the better it will be for you. Peter made no reply, but afterward he returned to those musical experiments that had been given up in days gone by. While he, by the sense of touch, would examine bits of bright-colored cloth, his mother, her nerves strained to their utmost tension and trembling with agitation, would try to represent the color by a correspondence in sound. Maxim no longer opposed these performances. He realized that his influence was of no avail against that inward impulse, and felt that it would be better to allow the blind man to pursue his own course, that in the end he might be convinced that all his efforts to combine these separate impressions were utterly in vain, and that this result might be the sooner attained, Maxim lent his own assistance to promote the blind man's researches. "'Uncle Maxim,' said Peter to him one day, you once described red to me by means of words so vividly i wish you would tell me about the other colors that you see in nature maxim paused to consider that is a very difficult matter but i will try i will begin by describing to you something with which you are perfectly familiar and that is blood blood courses through the veins and it cannot be seen it, it circulates through the body diffused by the heart which is constantly throbbing beating and burning with sorrow or joy when a sudden thought occurs to you or when from dreams you awake trembling and weeping it is because the heart has given a more rapid impulse to the blood and sent it coursing in bright streams to the brain well this blood is red red warm said the young man thoughtfully maxim paused was it well for him to go on with these fruitless illustrations? But when he saw the eagerness with which the blind man was hanging on his words, he sighed and made up his mind to continue. First, I will tell you about the heavens. If you lift your arm above your head, you will describe with it a semicircle in space. In the same way, infinitely far above us, we behold the vaulted semicircle of the hemisphere. It is blue. We call it the sky. The sun crosses it from east to west. That you already know. You can also tell when the sky is overcast. At such times its blue depths are hidden by the confused and portentous outlines of dense masses of clouds. You always perceive the approach of a threatening storm cloud. Yes, I am conscious of an influence that agitates the soul. You are right. A blue sky is the symbol of serene and lasting happiness. We watch for the return of the dark blue sky. The tempest will pass over, while the sky above remains ever the same. Knowing this, we can wait patiently for the passage of the storm. The sky, then, is blue, and the sea, when it is calm, is of the same color. Your mother has blue eyes, and Evelyn's eyes are also blue. Like the sky murmured the blind man tenderly. Blue eyes are said to be the token of a pure soul. Now I will tell you about the earth. A little while ago it was spring. Now the summer has come, and the surface of the ground is nearly all covered with green grass. The earth is black, and in the early spring the trunks and branches of the trees look black too and moist. But no sooner are these dark surfaces warmed by the rays of the sun than they send forth green grass and leaves. Vegetation requires light and warmth, but the amount must not be excessive. The reason why all that is green is so grateful to the eye is that it seems like the union of warmth and cool moisture. It arouses sensations of calm contentment and health but not those of passion or what the world calls happiness, do you understand? No, it is not quite clear, but please go on. Well, I don't know that I can make it that clearer, 
But I will tell you more. The summer grows hotter and brighter as it goes on. All vegetation seems to be oppressed with its own vitality. The leaves droop, and if the heat of the sun is not cooled by the refreshing rain, the green vegetation grows utterly parched and withers away. But with the approach of autumn, the juicy fruit begins to ripen among the brown and faded leaves, reddening most on the side next the sun, as if all the intensity and passion of vegetable nature were concentrated therein. You see that even here, red is, as ever, the symbol of passion. It is the color of luxury and delight, the color of sin, anger, and madness, the emblem of unforgiving vengeance. But you fail to follow me. Never mind. Go on, go on. The autumn comes, the fruit has grown heavy. It drops and falls to the ground, it dies. But the seed still lives, and therein lies the germ of a possibility of some future plant, with its luxuriant foliage and its fruit. The seed falls on the ground, and above this ground, the cold sun hangs low, the cold wind sweeps over it, the cold clouds float overhead. So life and the passions die slowly, imperceptibly. Day by day the blackness of the soil shows more and more plainly through the green grass, until at last the day comes when the snowflakes fall by millions and cover the ground. Humble and sorrowful in its widowhood, with a mantle of one uniform color, cold and white. The cold snow, the clouds that float in the inaccessible heights above our heads, the grand and sterile mountain peaks, all are white. It is the emblem of a passionless nature, of the cold purity of holiness, and of the future spiritual life. As to black. I know, interrupted the blind man, that signifies silence and quiescence. It is night. Yes, and therefore the emblem of death. Peter shuddered and said in a low tone, Yes, as you say yourself, of death. And for me, black is a prevailing color. You are wrong to say that, rejoined Maxim unhesitatingly, when you have access to all the pleasures of sound, warmth, and movement. Yes, replied the young man thoughtfully, that is true. Sounds also have their colors, and I have learned to know the red tones, the green and the majestic white ones, that soar aloft in inaccessible heights. But those nearest akin to me are the dark tones of grief, which reverberate close to the earth. I never rejoice when I play. I weep. Let me tell you, said Maxim earnestly, of one gift which you fail to appreciate at its proper value, one that has been bestowed upon you with a generosity rarely found among mortals. We have already spoken of light, warmth, and sound, but you know still another joy. You are surrounded by love. You take little heed of this, and the reason of your suffering may be ascribed to an egotistic cherishing of your own woes. Yes, exclaimed Peter passionately, I cherish them against my will. Where can I hide from them when they are with me wherever I go? Could you once realize that the world is full of sorrow, a hundredfold harder to bear than yours? Sorrows in comparison with which your life, rich in consolation and sympathy, may well be called bliss. Then, no, no, it is not so, interrupted the blind man angrily in his former tone of passionate excitement. I would change places with the lowest beggar, gladly would I wear his rags, he sees. Very well, said Maxim coldly, I will prove to you that you are mistaken. Part 5 In a small town, sixty verse from the estate of the Popelski, stands a miraculous Roman Catholic image. Persons versed in such matters could detail accurate accounts of its miraculous power, and all who make a pilgrimage to visit it on its holiday receive twenty days' absolution. Therefore, every year, on a certain day in the fall, the little town is so crowded that it can hardly be recognized. On the occasion of the anniversary, the old chapel is decorated with flowers and foliage. The merry pealing of the bells rings through the air. The carriages of the pans roll past. 
the town is filled with worshippers, bivouacking in the streets and squares and even in the neighboring fields. Nor are Catholics the only visitors. The reputation of the N image has spread far and wide, and the sick and afflicted Orthodox, particularly those from the cities, come also to visit it. On this particular holiday of which we would now speak, the road on both sides of the chapel was lined with a many-colored procession of human beings. One viewing this spectacle from the summit of any of the low hills, and circling the place, might have imagined that some gigantic serpent had stretched itself out over the road near the chapel, and lay there motionless, save when, from time to time, it lifted its many-colored scales. On both sides of the road, lined with two far-reaching rows of men and women, stood a whole regiment of beggars in a line, stretching their hands for alms. Maxim on his crutches, and Peter beside him leaning on Hoakim's arm, moved slowly along the street. Having passed the noisiest and most crowded spot, they came to the road where it entered the field. The hum of the many-voiced crowd, the cries of the Jewish tradesmen, the noise of the carriages, all that vast rumbling, as of mighty waves, mingled into one continuous surging volume of sound they had left behind them. But even here, where the crowd had diminished, they could still hear the tramp of the foot passengers and the hum of the wheels and human voices. A carriage train of teamsters was coming from the direction of the fields and, creaking heavily, turned into the nearest cross street. Peter listened absent-mindedly to this noisy life, wondering why Maxim had brought him there on such a day. Although Pan Popelski was a Catholic himself, the child had been baptized in the mother's church by an Orthodox priest, and this was no holiday of his. Nevertheless, he obediently followed Maxim, once in a while pulling his overcoat together, for it was chilly weather, and thus he walked along, his mind a prey to melancholy thoughts. Suddenly, in the midst of his absorption, Peter's attention was so violently arrested that he shuddered as he paused. The last houses of the city buildings ended here, and the wide thoroughfare now lay between fences and empty lots. Just where it entered the fields, some pious hands had erected a stone post with an icon and a lantern. The latter, which was never lighted, now hung creaking in the wind. At the very foot of the post crouched a group of blind beggars, who had been crowded from the desirable places by their more fortunate competitors. They sat there holding wooden cups, and some of them, from time to time, set up a heart-rending wail. Give to the blind, for Christ's sake! It was a cold day, and since early morning these beggars had been exposed to the cold wind that blew in gusts from the field. The crowd was so great that they could not keep themselves warm by exercise, and as by turns they drove their mournful lamentation, the plaintive note of physical suffering and of utter helplessness could plainly be discerned. The first words were quite distinct, but they were soon lost in a mournful wail, expiring in a shudder, as of one perishing from the cold. And yet the last low notes of the song almost lost in the midst of the noisy street, on reaching the human ear, struck it with a sense of the hopelessness of the enormous suffering they expressed. "'What is that?' exclaimed Peter, seizing his uncle suddenly by the arm. His face changed as though this moan were the embodied image of some ghost that suddenly rose before him. "'That?' repeated Maxim indifferently. "'They are only blind beggars.' blind like yourself, and somewhat cold besides. They would like to go home, but they are hungry. You have some money in your pocket, have you not? Throw them a five-copic piece. Peter, who in his anguish had rushed ahead, suddenly stopped. He took out his purse, and instinctively turning away, that he might not hear the mournful strains repeated, held it out to Maxim, saying, Give them this, give them all you have with you, only let us go away, for mercy's sake, let us go home as quickly as possible. I cannot, I cannot bear to hear it. Part 6 On the following day, Peter was lying in his room prostrated with a nervous fever. 
he lay tossing on his bed with a look of agony on his face, as if he heard some sound from which he was struggling to escape. The old local doctor attributed this illness to a cold, but Maxim well knew its real cause. It was a severe attack, and at the time of the crisis the sick man lay motionless for several days, but youth came off victorious in the end. One pleasant autumn morning a bright sunbeam crept in at the window and rested near the invalid's head. Anna Mikhailovna, turning to Evelyn, said, Please draw the shade, I dread that light. Rising in obedience to her request, the girl was arrested by the unexpected sound of the blind man's voice. Never mind, please. Let it be as it is. Both women leaned over him with rapture. Do you know me? asked the mother. Yes, replied the invalid, then paused as though trying to recall some memory of the past. Ah, yes, he said softly. How dreadful it was. Evelyn laid her hand on his lips. Don't, don't, you must not talk. It is bad for you. Pressing the hand to his lips, Peter covered it with kisses. Tears stood in his eyes. He wept long and freely and seemed to gain relief. I shall never forget your lesson, he said, turning his face toward Maxim, who entered at that moment. I thank you. You have helped me to realize my own happiness by making me acquainted with the woes of others. God grant that I may never forget the lesson. The disease once conquered, the youthful constitution made short work of recovery. In two weeks Peter was again on his feet. A great change had taken place in him. The serious shock to his nerves was succeeded by a pensive but calm and gentle sadness. His very features were changed, having lost all trace of the old mental suffering. Maxim feared lest this might prove but a phase occasioned by the depression of the nervous system but months went by and still the blind man's mood showed no sign of change the realization of one's own misfortunes sometimes paralyzes the energy and plunges the soul into a state of passive endurance while the knowledge of the sorrows of others will on the contrary often rouse one to energetic action and uplifting the whole nature stimulate mental activity and lead one to seek opportunities for showing sympathy a longing to relieve human misery had now risen in peter's heart supplanting his former vain endeavour to escape from personal grief he had as yet no clear idea as to the ways and means and had but slender confidence in his own power yet he was inspired by hope. End of chapter 6